Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to this uh, wonderful meeting. Celebrate this uh, great effect uh, uh, anniversary. And um, I will um, try to talk about uh, how this uh, effect extends beyond the uh, uh, usual laboratory uh, environment and can play some very important role in uh, black hole physics. And in particular, can also play some important role. Should I put this microphone on? Mm. It's okay. Um, in uh, probing, possibly probing uh, the, the short distance physics in uh, laboratory experiments, okay? Um, so this is the outline of my talk. I will uh, discuss, uh, remind you a couple of things uh, from black hole, uh, the usual story that black holes do not carry hair. Um, and then how the Arono bomb type uh, hair can play an important role. And uh, then I'll discuss implications for uh, tabletop experiments and uh, uh, maybe even LHC. So there is uh, the, 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 the quantum Arono bomb hair for, uh, for black holes was uh, historically was discovered by, in this paper by Krauss and Wilczek. Uh, but uh, the, what I will talk about uh, will be a little bit different, uh, complementary. Uh, they were talking about uh, ZN uh, quantum hair of uh, black holes. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> let me just, um, uh, everybody knows this very well, that uh, black holes are classical solutions, uh, strongly gravitating objects. And um, the escape velocity, uh, uh, for, for, for whom escape velocity, velocity at, at a certain distance is, uh, exceeds the speed of light. So they are, uh, classically, they are absolutely black. But quantum mechanically, they operate uh, so-called uh, Hawking radiation with temperature inverse R. Actually, there was a discussion of this uh, uh, yesterday evening. Um, now, the, the black holes, they have this very uh, in, important property that uh, we call, uh, sometimes we call it no hair, uh, black hole no hair, no hair theorems, um, which tells you that uh, black holes can only be characterized by um, the quantum numbers, which you can measure at infinity. Okay, so basically, let's say if I take this laptop and I collapse it into a black hole, of course it will be tiny, but it doesn't matter, it still will be a pretty classical black hole. And um, after a certain finite time, there will be no way to distinguish this black hole from any other formed in any other way, uh, as long as the masses and the and electric charge and the angular momentum are the same. Okay, so in other words, there are no quantum numbers, so this laptop carries huge baryon number. But the moment it becomes a black hole, that, that memory is gone. So black holes have no memory where they come from. Uh, the only memory about their origin is, is, is encoded in their quantum numbers that are associated with massless gauge fields. So things that you can measure at infinity. So this is the classical story, okay? So for instance, as I said, these good quantum numbers are uh, the electric charge, uh, and momentum, and the spin, and the electric mass, and the electric charge, okay? So on the other hand, if there is a, suppose now we have a gauge field or a, or a, or a messenger of an, of an interaction, which, which is massive, okay? So ordinarily, there will be uh, a charge associated, something like a, a charge associated with this messenger. For instance, imagine that photon has a small mass, okay? So normally, if photon has a mass and the, the Compton wavelength of a photon is uh, the galactic size, uh, in, in laboratory measurements, you will not notice any difference. So the, the charged particles still will uh, create a Coulomb electric field and you can measure it, okay? But that's not true for a black hole, okay? So black holes cannot have an electric field, uh, electric hair, if photon has even a tiny charge, okay? So if a photon had a mass, then the charged black holes, the stationary black holes would not exist. Um, and uh, so this is a uh, uh, so-called uh, no hair uh, story uh, that the, the black holes do not carry hair under massive gauge fields, okay? So for instance, if you have a spin two, if you have a particle, let's say, which is charged under some spin two uh, field and you throw it into a black hole, this spin two hair disappears after, after finite time. So this was proven by Bekenstein and uh, uh, so this, the proof is pretty robust. Now, I will focus, as I will, so what I will take, I will take just as an example because I want to illustrate how the Arono bomb quantum hair avoids this classical no hair theorem. So to illustrate this point, I will, I will choose a spin two uh, gauge field, but you can generalize it to, 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 to an arbitrary one, okay? So 
Now, this is a, so in particular, this, this was the original proof by Bregenstein in, uh, uh, about the quantum spin two pair. So now this is a theory. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think this works in this way. Anyway, uh, so this is a theory of a um, massive uh, spin two field. And it's unique at the linear level, okay? So at the linear level, there's a unique theory that exists, the so-called Pauli fields theory of massive spin two. And um, so what happens is this, the, the, there are two terms. The first term is the linearized Einstein. Oh, thank you very much. So the first term is the linearized Einstein term, okay? And the second term is the massive term. So if I exclude this massive term, this would be simply a, a Einstein gravity, okay? It's just graviton. So now, so now suppose you have a mass, so if, of course, if you have a massless spin two state, then it, it, you can measure its, uh, its field, it's just the mass of a black hole. So now suppose this field has a mass, okay? So then the point is that uh, for m equals zero, there is a gauge invariance, okay? Because you can shift, uh, this is just the generalization of the usual electrodynamics gauge invariance for uh, the Maxwell field. So you can shift the, the spin two by derivative of a vector, okay? Um, but naively for m equals uh, m non-zero, the, the, um, there is no gauge invariance, naively. So um, h mu nu is uh, ob physically observable, okay? It's physically observable. And uh, therefore, must vanish outside the horizon, and therefore, it has to vanish everywhere. So now, the, the point is, which is very important, that, um, so again, as, as, as of course, as you know very well, the, the, the Aronobom effect is about gauge invariance, okay? Uh, and when we talk about gauge invariance, uh, a priori, it, it makes no sense unless we specify degrees of freedom that transform under it, okay? So now, the point is that, Gauge theories, w w this is very important to understand that gauge theories, even when the gauge field has a mass, they continue to be gauge invariance. Because gauge invariance is not a symmetry of nature, it's, it's an ex actually it's a redundancy of our description. And this redundancy is there anyway. So the point is, so for instance, if, if photon had a mass, the, the, the theory would still be gauge invariant. Why? Because photon would acquire a new uh, longitudinal degree of freedom, and the, and the gauge transformations of the two would compensate each other. Okay. Um, so there is exactly the same true for massive spin two. So in other words, uh, when I, f if I have a massless state, like no, massless spin two is uh, Einstein's graviton, okay? Graviton has two physical degrees of freedom, two polarizations, okay? A gravitational wave has two polarizations. Now the point is that the moment you put a non-zero mass for a spin two, this is no longer the same, same state. You are changing discontinuously your theory. So you are adding three more degrees of freedom, okay? So now it has five degrees of freedom. And of course, now if you want to talk about gauge invariance, you, you have to look closely how these five degrees of freedom transform. And that's the whole point. The point is that adding mass to a spin two doesn't kill gauge invariance. Theory continues to be gauge invariant because this gauge transformation of two degrees of freedom is exactly compensated by the three new degrees of freedom. Okay? So in other words, you can write down, uh, this is the useful form, we can write down the massive spin two in terms of uh, a ma massless one, this H hat, this would be, would be normal Einsteinian graviton, plus a vector. And uh, what happens is that the gauge, of, obviously this theory now is gauge invariant. Every, everybody will agree with me because the, the, there is a gauge shift of H mu nu hat under a derivative of a vector, and this is exactly compensated by the, the shift of a vector, okay? So theory is perfectly gauge invariant. Um, sometimes they, people call this a Stuckelberg language, but it's, uh, this is not a language. This is the, the, the physics of the, of, the, of the massive gauge field, okay, period. Um, so now the point is this, okay, now I want to uh, avoid, so now the question is, once we realize that theory is hiddenly gauge invariant, how we uh, avoid this no here uh, story about black holes, okay? And the point is, now, now let's make a parallel with the normal Aronobohm effect, okay? By the way, uh, let me remind you that the Aronobohm effect would continue to be exactly as it is, even if photon had a mass. Aronobohm effect is completely insensitive to the mass of a photon, okay? Um, why? Because, it's a, because the, the, the configuration of the gauge field outside the solenoid is, a, is pure gauge anyway, okay? So, uh, so what we want to see, we want to see whether this theory has a locally pure gauge configuration which, however, is topologically non-trivial, and you cannot remove it, okay? 
Now, in the case of a normal Arano bomb consideration, it's a solenoid, right? And we are looking for something which is topologically non-trivial in a circle, okay? Now, for a black hole, black hole is like a, a spherical object. It's a point light uh, object. So if we want to have something topologically non-trivial, we have to look for something which, is, uh, which corresponds to a sphere, which is an unremovable sphere, okay? And um, the answer is, yes, there is such a configuration, trivially, and uh, you agree with me that these equations, they have trivially the solution when the vector component of this spin two, this A, has a configuration of a uh, Dirac's magnetic monopole, okay? And uh, correspondingly, H hat, that also has similar configuration, with the, it's just simply a symmetric derivative of A, and they both vanish. So in other words, the, the physical field, H mu nu, classic, which you can probe classically, the physical de uh, uh, degree of freedom, the physical field, is identically zero everywhere in the vacuum. But there is a non-trivial topology because there is a configuration which looks like a Dirac magnetic monopole, okay? Now, um, you should not get confused. I call it a Dirac magnetic monopole simply because of the configuration. There is no magnetic field anywhere. This has nothing to do with Dirac's monopole. It's just a, this is a, this is a longitudinal vector component of a spin two field, okay? So, um, so basically in components, you can write it in this way explicitly, okay? So there is this configuration. Again, anything that you could measure classically outside the origin is identically zero. At every given point, field is identically zero, classical field. But there is a quantum non-trivial effect, as we, as we shall see, okay? So, um, and uh, as you know, you can formulate this uh, trivially in terms of uh, uh, Wu and Yang uh, without any reference to the Dirac string, or you can formulate it with a Dirac string, just, a, just as an usual magnetic monopole. Uh, now, um, it's trivial that in this case, Dirac string is unobservable. Again, it's unobservable trivially. Why? Because uh, there are no particles which are charged, electromagnetically charged under this A mu, because A mu is a component of the spin two. And so there is no Dirac, Dirac string is unobservable. So it's a perfectly well-defined, non-singular superposition, uh, configuration, okay? Which is, of course, it's singular at the origin and should be because it's a black hole. Um, but outside, it's a pure gauge configuration. So now the question is, uh, now the question is, how can we probe this, okay? And the answer is, we can probe this by Arona bomb effect, literally, now. Um, of course, generically, this will not be an electromagnetic Arona bomb effect. It will be an Arona bomb effect of, uh, of corresponding, of this, the solenoid you have to make, which should be pretty special. But we'll go to the electromagnetic case in a second. So now, so what is the story here? The story is, uh, you can probe this uh, configuration, okay, this, this, this uh, uh, pure gauge configuration globally, by global experiment, by top topological non-trivial experiment, if you have a solenoid, just exactly as in this case of the Arona bomb case, you need a solenoid. Now, the role of the solenoid in this case is played by a anything that looks like a string, okay? After all, what is the solenoid? If you take a solenoid and look from the large distance, it's just a string, okay? It's a magnetic flux, which is localized, trapped into a tube, okay? It's a flux tube. So, if you have a string which couples to F mu nu through this interaction, okay, uh, then you can perf per perform an usual Arano bomb experiment and detect this flux, uh, de detect the, 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 the magnetic, the, this, uh, sorry, the, uh, the quantum Arano bomb hair of, of a black hole. So what is this experiment? So, so this is the string which, uh, so x, x mu, x nu are simply uh, coordinates on the string wall sheet, right? So if I have a, so I mean, great, great thing about physics is that <coughs> any string from large distances, whether this is a super string, or a cosmic string, or a solenoid in your lab with a flux tube, from large distances, it has exactly the same action, okay? What is the, ch the string has just one characteristic. It has a length and it has a tension, okay? That's nothing else. So, so the only characteristics of the string is the surface that it sweeps. When it moves in the space, it sweeps the surface. So the, there are coordinates on this surface, x, uh, x uh, coordinates x, and that's it. So this, this interaction is unique. Whether you are considering a solenoid or you are considering a superstring, this is the only l l large distance interaction you can write down between F mu nu and your string, okay? So if you have this interaction, then what happens? So now I have this string, 
and I have a black hole which carries this configuration that I described. Okay, so what happens? Uh, if, you, if you consider the following scattering experiments, when you, either you take a black hole around uh, through the string, string loop, or you lasso a string on, on a black hole, doesn't matter, okay? Uh, you get a phase shift. And this is literally the same Aronobon phase shift. Now, why? Uh, because when I sweep, so this is, this is the process, right? So you consider the following process. You have a black hole, you, have, you, are, you are taking the string loop, and the string loop lassos this black hole, and again disappears, okay? So now, the, the, uh, in this case, you have a phase shift because the change of the action is exactly the magnetic flux of this magnetic flux in a quote-unquote, the flux of this F nu, the one that uh, we, we had before, this flux coming from the string, uh, from, the, from the black hole, uh, through the surface that is, that, that is swapped by the string, okay? And so this is exactly the, uh, what we got here is precisely the Aronobon type phase shift. So Q is this coupling to this, solen to this uh, string, okay? The string is red. And, uh, and mu is the magnetic, uh, magnet, mu is the Aronobom hair of a black hole. Now, of course, mu, we don't know what it is. I just demonstrated that you can have consistent solutions with arbitrary mu. Mu is a parameter of a fundamental theory. We don't know what it is, okay? Um, now, in the other words, the point is the following, that uh, whenever you have a uh, gauge, massive gauge field, spin one, spin two, arbitrary spin, the, the, your, hiddenly, your theory contains a topological coupling. Okay? It's like a theta term in QCD. And this topological coupling, uh, classically, it plays absolutely no role because it's a boundary term. But quantum mechanically, it gives you a run of bomb shift uh, when you do the scattering experiment of, on, on, on a given uh, black hole. And so it gives you, um, and it's always detectable if this condition is satisfied. It's, you, this is usual a run of bomb condition for the, uh, for, for the uh, relation between the charge and. So now, now you can ask the following thing. Okay, fine, it's, very, it's great if you have a black hole which in principle has the detectable hair. Uh, this is great, but what this has to do with tabletop experiments, okay? Now, of course, if black hole carries hair under some exotica uh, so that I need a super string to do the scattering experiment, I can detect it, but it's, it's very hard to do, right? The uh, one centimeter of the super string uh, length has the mass of a comet, approximately. So obviously, that's a very costly experiment to do. So you need something more, uh, more, uh, more conventional. So the point is this, right? That, um, in fact, you will get exactly this effect, which is measurable now by the usual Aronobom effect, uh, by usual solen solenoid, if you replace this coupling, this term, by the following boundary term, in which your, uh, the, this longitudinal component, this gauge field of the, the spin two, is uh, coupled to the normal electrodynamics, F nu nu. So now this is normal Maxwellian electrodynamics. Now suppose you have this term in your action. In the other words, so you replace this guy with this other guy, okay? So, and the question is what happens in this case? So what's the effect of this term? In fact, the effect of this term is exactly the same as what I said, but now you can use for the measurement the normal solenoid in your laboratory, okay? Why? Because the point is this. this term tells you that when I, th if in the limit in which the solenoid, if I'm doing my experiment at distances much larger than the width of the solenoid, as I told you, there is absolutely no difference whether you are dealing with the so solenoid or a cosmic string or a super string. Because again, everybody has the ch same characteristics. It's the flux tube, which has one characteristic, the length, and the one effective constant, which parameterizes the flux, how, how, how much flux is flowing through this solenoid, period. So this is the flux. So in other words, this coupling, this, uh, this term, simply reduces to the exactly the string type, string type coupling. Because after all, there is no difference whether if you have a black hole and you are lassoing it, there is absolutely no difference whether you lasso it by a, a, a fundamental super string or you lasso it by, by a solenoid made in your lab. The effect is exactly the same, okay? And that's the, the uh, after all, this is, again, this is the demonstration of the same fact that uh, you can also think about fundamental superstrings as uh, tiny, very, very, very small width uh, flux tubes, okay? And uh, there is absolutely no, from this point of view, there is no difference between them and any other solenoid, okay? And this is the great thing, because now what happens is that, as, I, as we said, the, the, so normal aronom bomb effect is what? How you measure it in the lab? You, you have a solenoid, so this is this red flux solenoid, right? And you have a particle 
charged particle, and you take it around, okay? Um, now, or a black hole, doesn't matter. So you take it around. So now what happens is that you do exactly the same thing here. The, the, this coupling effectively in the, in the limit in which you do ex your experiment, the distance is much larger than the solenoid width, which, you, which, is, the true, which is true anyway, be uh, becomes um, simply this section. So it's exactly the same thing. And so you get a phase shift. So you get a phase shift of this form. Again, it's the usual Aronobon phase shift. A phi times this mu, where mu is this quantum hair of a black hole. So now the, the, the point is this, right? So this is interesting because of the following reason. Because you see, what is, the, what is, what is great about Aronobom effect is that this is effect which you can do at large distances and which is completely insensitive to the mass of the gauge field. Now the gauge field, the spin two that I was discussing, notice that the mass of that spin two doesn't enter anywhere, okay? It can be as, as heavy as the Planck mass. And nevertheless, the effect is detectable at large distances. Now, why? What's the reason for it? The reason for it is topology, because Arono bomb effect is a topological effect. It's completely insensitive to the mass of a photon. Okay? It, it would be true for any mass of a photon. Of course, if photon is very heavy, then it's, it will be hard to design the experiment in the lab. But the, the fact that you can detect it at large distances is completely insensitive to this, uh, to this statement. Okay? Um, so therefore, you can ask the following question. So th therefore, in, in nature, this means that, now if this is true, the, uh, this, the, the fact that this mu can be non-zero. Now, unfortunately, from the point of view of low energy theory, it's impossible to say whether mu is zero or non-zero. We don't know, okay? So mu is some new quantum number, which is which high energy theory, our microscopic theory, endows a black hole with this quantum number. We don't know what it is. Then you can ask the following question. Suppose I watch my black hole evaporate, okay? So the end result of the black hole evaporations are particles. Um, so what happens with this quantum number? Now, this quantum number cannot disappear. It's a topological number, uh, this quantum Aronobom here. So this means that it has to be uh, transferred to a particle of a, of a finite end product of the black hole evaporation, okay? Um, so then the question is, uh, and I don't know the answer to that question, uh, can ordinary particles carry this mu, this quantum Aronobom uh, hair, okay, under this uh, heavy gauge field? And, uh, um, well, the, from the point of view of low energy theory, the answer is yes. I mean, there is nothing that, uh, no obstacle, fundamental obstacle, and it's measurable. So, how would this uh, manifest itself? This would manifest itself in the Arono, usual Aronobom effect. Effectively, the, some particle which you normally would think that it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neutral particle, would exhibit the properties of the, of the charge, okay? So um, they will uh, have some funny, tiny fractional charge. Uh, that, so from all the point of view, it will look like a charged particle, okay? So which means that effectively it is becoming a charged particle because of this mu uh, quantum hair. Uh, um, in, in a sense, you can also understand this as so-called Witten's effect, uh, but okay, uh, it's a bit uh, involved uh, to discuss. Um, um, okay, so. Now, um, the, this discussion, as I said, I mean, I, I just use this spin two as, a, as, a, as an example. So this can be generalized to an arbitrary uh, massive, uh, uh, ma arbitrary high spin, starting from spin one, high spin uh, uh, massive gauge field, okay? And uh, so in each case, you can have a corresponding uh, quantum number, this Aronobom hair, which can be endowed, so you can, the black holes can carry it for sure, and then the question is whether particles can continue carrying it. And if they can, then you can detect them in, in, in laboratory. I don't know, there are all these experiments. Uh, uh, Nina, was, was, I don't know if she will have time to talk about it. They were thinking about some interferometry experiments, which would be very sensitive to tiny, charge, uh, uh, ch tiny charges of the particles. I don't know, people are doing these experiments with uh, uh, no, neutron neutrality, for instance, that's another possibility. So this, this, this hair will show up as some kind of tiny charge. Um, how much time do I have, five minutes? Okay, so now um, in, in the remaining uh, five minutes, let me just uh, uh, tell you uh, the, another implication of this uh, Aronobom hair. Uh, the point is that actually it's not completely true. I, I told you that this mu is a fundamental parameter, okay? It's like an electric charge. So there is some microscopic theory, and this theory tells us if, if a given black hole can carry it. If it cannot carry, if, if, it, if, if mu is zero, then there is no effect, I'm sorry. If mu is non-zero, we can detect it, okay, at large distances. 
Now, um, however, this is not completely true that we don't know uh, we don't know anything about mu. So, in particular, we know that actually mu times q has to be quantized in units of one over n. Okay, where n is some integer number, and this n satisfies the following bound: that n has to be less than the Planck square divided by uh, m star square, where m star square is the uh, is a mass of a black hole or a particle with the smallest charge to uh, mass difference, uh, ch char charge to mass ratio, okay? And um, now you can prove this by uh, the following thought experiment, actually. I don't have time to go into much details, but you can prove it that um, actually, um, um, if, you, if you imagine a black hole and we, we throw the n, n units of this quantum hair carrying uh, charges, and then we wait for the black hole to evaporate, you are, you, are you are led to the proof that, to the conclusion that this, that bound has to be satisfied. Otherwise, you are running into the conflict, co conflict with uh, either black hole thermality or the energy con conservation, okay? And so this, um, this tells you that, um, so uh, you arrive to this bound. So the, the maximum n is this. Um, so now you can turn this around, uh, the, you can turn this argument uh, um, around, actually, and um, then, so now I'm going to, to a speculative part, uh, okay? Um, so you can turn this argument around and say, you can say, okay, uh, this means that uh, the scale, the scale M star um, and the, the, the quantum hair, they are, uh, they are correlated, okay? So this means that if we postulate that there are particles with a tiny quantum hair, uh, with a tiny number mu, then for the, by consistency in these theories, the scale where gravity becomes strong has to be lowered, okay? So there is this connection. And uh, so, um, I don't know, there are these ideas to use uh, maybe this uh, tiny quantum hair, particles with tiny quantum hair for uh, addressing the, the, the hierarchy problem. Uh, now, the great thing about this is that in that case, the black holes, uh, the smallest black holes available, they become very light. And so, uh, if you address uh, the, the, the gauge hierarchy problem, the hierarchy problem in the standard model, by postulating this, that, that, they are, that they are, there is a particle with a tiny quantum hair, this implies that uh, the, the lightest black holes can have TV mass. And uh, so, these are, so in, in this particular case, these are the black holes that people are talking, uh, uh, pro producing them at LHC experiments, uh, at LHC, okay? All right, so let me conclude. Um, the, um, now, there are two important messages that, uh, the, the, the first one is that uh, Aronobom quantum hair, this gives a remarkable possibility to, to probe the short distance physics in uh, large distance experiments, okay? Um, and uh, the reason is because it's topological. And because of its topological nature, the effect of this hair extends far, extends to infinity because it extends beyond the Compton wavelength of a gauge field. And uh, this is very important. Okay, so, and then we can look in laboratory for this uh, appearance of the seemingly uh, charged particles with uh, tiny charges, and that would be a signal of something like this. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. No, no, absolutely. There is there's no proof. But I mean, the fact that it may, may be non-zero and it's detectable, it's already, it's already remarkable. Because we have this folklore about uh, black holes, that bl black holes do not carry any information about their origin, etc. This, uh, this tells you that this sta those statements are purely classical. Quantum mechanically, Aronobom effect can distinguish different, uh, between different black holes. So you can have black holes with mu zero and mu non-zero. And, that, and that's an observable effect at large distances. But of course, I completely agree. So mu uh, may or may not be zero. I mean, there are fundamental theories in which mu is predicted to be non-zero. That's a, and there are models in which, yeah. You, you, you are talking about a phase shift. These are Absolutely, it's an Aronobon phase shift. Wait, but, but what field does experience a phase shift? So, well, what, what do you mean? This is a part. Yeah, this is a part. So, for, of course, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the ideal example that I considered, I discussed it first. So this is the, whoever carries this mu, the, 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 the quantum here mu, behaves exactly as electrons behave in our own bomb experiment. So the, okay. 
these are these guys. Now, of course, for the classical black holes, or big classical black holes, you, the point is, is, for the big classical black holes, this is of academic importance. So the phase shift is in the, the mu field, or? No, mu is the charge. If mu is like a charge, what happens is that mu acts like a charge for a black hole, OK? So in other words, you, Sorry, the, so the, the black hole experience that phase? Yeah, yeah, of course, yes. But for the classical black holes, Yes, but of course, that's, a, that's what I'm saying. For the classical black holes, this, there is an effect. There is always an effect. But of course, for classical black holes, the effect is tiny, and you can never do that. You can never find a solenoid to lasso an astrophysical black hole anyway. So that's not the, the point. The point is that once these black holes evaporate, or the small quantum black holes, or any remnant of them, this quantum hair cannot disappear. It's, it's endowed once and forever. So this means that some states in your theory, some quantum states, should be endowed by this quantum hair. Now, and those can be anywhere. I mean, for instance, if you ask me, I mean, can an elementary particle can carry, can carry this mu, the tiny quantum here? I don't have any fundamental reason why they cannot, okay? So which means that, and in the experiment, this will show up as a tiny fractional shift of a charge. So you may be surprised. Now, but amazingly, for instance, I, we tried to understand in the previous experiments whether this would be already, you could already put some bound on mu from the existing Aronobom experiment. And the point is that you cannot even. Why? Because usually when people are doing Aronobo, suppose in, you, 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 in Aronobo experiment it appears like it, as if your electron charge got shifted. What you would do, you would attribute it to systematics, period. Right? You would say, okay, I don't care because I'm only looking at the differences. So here this would appear, for instance, as a sh tiny shift of an electron charge. That, that's one thing. Maybe I miss something. Yeah. Because you conclude that you Experiment. Yeah. What do you play the role of black hole in laboratory experiments? Any, any particle which is the remnant of the black, black hole operation. Any particle. So this tells you that if so, this this tells you if mu is yeah, if mu is non-zero, this means that there are some perturbative states which finally get endowed by this mu. You cannot have something carried by the black hole and not carried by their remnants. Black holes evaporate. That's the that's the point. So this means that. Then, some elementary particles in, the the in your uh, theory must carry, must be endowed by this quantum hair mu. <laughs> no, everything is general. No, no, I disagree. No, look, I mean, the, 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 the question, uh, the, there are two different things. There is a matter of principle for the black holes that this is an exception from the, from the classical no here theory. Now, I could tell you the same about the electric charge. I mean, electric charge is not something you can predict. In the standard model, electric charges are input. This is why, because there is a microscopic theory, microscopic theory, and that endows you with some electric charges. And, and that's it, right? The same is true about mu. All, all we are saying is that there is a new quantum number, which is, which is different, and it's there, and it will get transferred to particles, and it's measurable in laboratory. And this will be an in, in, and this will be inevitable signal of very short distance physics, if, if it's measured. Yeah. OK, last short question. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, right. No, this one can be literally seen at infinity. Why? Because this is a relativistic theory of a fundamental quantum Aronobom hair. Okay? Now, the limitations in the usual laboratory experiments are because your uh, materials are composite, and you have to do all the, all the other effects are interfering. There are always some t t tails of Van der Waals type tails, etc., etc. Those are technical. But the point is that the, the phase, once it exists, is topological. Topological numbers cannot change, because they, they, they are either 0 or 1. They cannot go from 1 continuously to 0, right? So that's the, that's the reason. You're talking about technical problems, so you're talking about the... Technically, of course, always there is a problem. No, here, here no. This is a... Yeah. Okay. Right. So you. let's thank Dr. Valley again.